Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to another video for History by Podcast. Today, I am joined by Professor Kara Cooney. And for those that are not familiar with her, she is a professor of Egyptian art and architecture and chair of the Department of Near Eastern Languages and Cultures at UCLA. Cooney's research in coffin reuse, primarily focusing on the 21st di dynasty of Egypt, is ongoing. Her research investigates the socioeconomic and political turmoil that have plagued the period, ultimately affecting funerary and burial practices in ancient Egypt. This project has taken around the world over the span of five to six years studying and document more than 300 coffins and collections around the world, including Cairo, London, Paris, Berlin, and Vatican City. Her first trade book, The Woman Who Would Be King, Hatshepsut's Rise to Power in Ancient Egypt, is an illuminating bi biography of its least well-known female king and was published in 2014 by Crown Publishing Group. Her latest book, When Women, when Women Ruled the World, Six Queens of Egypt, was published in 2018 by National Geographic Press. And if any of that is a little outdated, feel free to correct me. But, uh, but that being said, welcome to the show, Professor Cooney. Thanks so much, Jacob. Glad to be here. All right, let's get right into it. Um, as you probably have heard, there's a lot of people out there that believe that Horus is very similar to Jesus. You've got books out there, people claiming that. You've got people on the internet claiming that. But they don't examine his father, Osiris, who is very similar to Jesus, actually legitimately similar to Jesus, better than his son ever was. But yet a lot of people, for some reason, focus on his son. And they, and several scholars have debunked the, the so-called parallels. Well, they were both born on December 25th, and they both had 12 disciples. They say stuff like that. None of that's true. When we look at Osiris, he actually dies and rises again and not Horus. So what do you make of that? Yes, it's it probably is confusing for many people who are used to monotheism and used to there being an idea of one God to then immerse themselves in a polytheistic tradition. And before we continue, this video is sponsored by Atlas VPN. Afraid of being tracked online? Afraid that your internet provider and others may see what you look up? Want to feel safe and secure again? Then look no further. Right now is the best time to get yourself Atlas VPN, for it is having a Black Friday price cut and is on sale for only $1.70, plus six extra months. And Atlas VPN will protect all of your devices at home with only one subscription. Furthermore, it also can provide you access to TV shows, such as Friends on Netflix, not accessible in the United States. It also makes sure your searches on Google are private, and you can search the web with real and organic search results. And you can do it without your activity being tracked. It also prevents ads and malware, and it even blocks all malicious links and trackers and notifies you when someone is trying to steal your data. It also lets you save coins while shopping online, and you can get the best deals from online subscriptions, including Netflix, Spotify, and even airlines, hotels, and more. Atlas VPN has benefited me greatly. In the past, some have tried to dox my location, but with Atlas VPN, it puts a stop to all of that. And I can even watch films and TV shows not accessible in the United States, including an uncensored version of Vikings that I can now watch thanks to Atlas VPN. So again, Atlas VPN is on sale right now for only $1.70 plus six extra months. And if you happen to be unsatisfied with your product, there is a 30-day money-back guarantee. And you'll be provided a full refund. Use the promo link in the description below to sign up or use your phone to scan the QR code on the screen now. But do so before the Black Friday deal concludes. In which gods can often take on similar traits or be connected to one another in a much closer way than we might imagine, such that Horus is the offspring of his father Osiris, and yet in a sense, Horus is Osiris reborn. Horus is Osiris in an earthly sense, whereas Osiris is the god that allows Horus to exist. So the two are very much like one being. And if you think I'm anticipating a kind of trinity, a god, the father, and the Holy Spirit, that's exactly what I'm doing. And I'm saying that the Egyptians were probably the first religious tradition to come up with that kind of idea that you can have multiple manifestations of one divinity with different names, different bodies, different aspects. and it takes transitions like death and birth or murder <laughs> to bring them together in, in some kind of way. It's that, that moment of a life change that, that merges and also splits apart the different manifestations. 
Didn't they even at times conflate Ra with Horus and call him Ra Horakita? Uh, Ra Harakti. And okay. uh, it's Ray Horus of the two horizons. Ray mm -hmm. Hor Achti, and the Achti is the two horizons. And there were multiple manifestations that that put the hawk together with the sun god and and created a different kind of manifestation. There's also Horus the Elder, who has a solar aspect as well, and um, and and a number of other ones that we see more uh, readily in a later Egyptian polytheistic tradition. Many of these ideas probably pre-existed when they were written down in a Greco-Roman time period, but they we, we have the best evidence for them in these later texts and things like that. So yes, Ray Harakti is a syncretism of a solar aspect of a, of a, of a hawk god and con connected with uh, the sun god incarnate. And then it's the god that rises and sets. That's what the two horizons are referring to. It's the god who is who dies and is born. And you you put those together. So if you like Hor Ray Harakti, is Osiris and Horus all put together into one being? And that's what I thought. So that's interesting because Ra would be this is how it's supposed to go. The father of Shu and Tufnut, and they're the parents of Geb and Nut, and they are the parents of Heru or Horus the Older, Osiris, Isis, Nut, and I think Anubis as well, if, I'm, if I remember correctly. So the you're talking about the Heliopolitan Aeneid. Okay. Big, big mouthful, I just said there. So Heliopolitan, <laughs> it just comes from the city of Heliopolis, which is the Greek name for the city Iunu. And there you have temples dedicated to the god Ra-Atum, or just Atum, A-T-U-M is the way we spell it. But the Egyptians did it with the reed leaf, the T, and then the M. And Atum is the, the first god of creation, according to the Heliopolitan creation mythology. And he's floating around in empty... Or, or, or chock full of primeval matter space that's darkness, infinity, all, all of this um, pre primeval um, existence. And he comes to understand that he could exist separate from this primeval mass. And he starts to have sex with himself. And that, that moment of sex with himself is with his own hand, his female element. And then he sneezes out a light-filled void, and that is the god Shu, the god of light and the god of emptiness. And he sneezes out the goddess Tefnut, who is the goddess of moisture, um, kind of a moisture space, if you like. So the god of light space and moisture space, they have sex with one another. They create the next generation, and that's Geb, the earth god, and Nut, the sky goddess. And then they have sex with one another, and they create the last four of the Ennead, and that would be Seth and Osiris, the male part of the of the quad, and then uh, Nephthys, who's married to Seth, and Isis, who's married to Osiris. And of course, Horus is at the end of the Aeneid. He's the tenth member of the Aeneid, if you like. And many would argue he's the raison d'etre for the entire Aeneid, because it's Horus who is the ruler on Earth for whom these mythologies are created. Would it be fair to say that this? is somewhat reminiscent of the way the Gospel of John portrays Jesus, that I and the Father are one. I know that not all New Testament scholars would say that, that that Jesus and God are portrayed as the same person in the Gospel of John. The reason why I bring that up, also in the context of the Holy Trinity that comes later, is, okay, so you've got Ra. He's the progenitor of the Pantheon, but he's also the end of the Pantheon, because sometimes he's, he's the same person as Horus. So he's the creator of everything, mankind, dies and rises again at the same time. It, it just kind of reminds me of John's view of Jesus a lot. So what, what is the exact statement in the in the Gospel of John? It's in John 10, 30, I and the Father are one. Okay. So yeah. th this idea of there being many gods and yet one source of those gods is a henotheistic idea that many Egyptologists believe Egyptians did indeed invent. And the even without Akhenaten saying that there's only the Aten sun disk in the sky, there are notions that if you look at Leiden Hymn 100, where they say all gods are three, and then one is the head, one is the body, one is the, the spirit. And, and you can actually 
understand that all gods are one in that sense. The Egyptians are perhaps not as overt in claiming the one because Akhenaten was so overt in claiming that that the Aten was the only one, the unique one. But Egyptians are very good at moving the gods in and out of one another so that one manifestation can blend into another manifestation, which makes you realize that these gods have much more in common than than not. And these gods can be with one another. They can meld with one another. Yes, there's sexual connection, but really I'm talking about gods becoming the same being in a sense. And, and then they can split apart. So you'll see all these texts that talk about the god Atum. And the god Atum can meld with Ra. And he can meld with other elements as well. But then he has all of these Ba spirits. So he can splinter off into all of these different parts of himself uh, with the Ba spirit that does this and the Ba spirit that does that. Or the Ba spirit of this hour and the Ba spirit of that hour. So you get the understanding that you can have one and you can have a dozen manifestations. You can have 72 manifestations. And this is not disturbing for the polytheistic mind. It's more disturbing for our minds. Didn't um, Pharaoh Akhenaten believe that he was the intermediator between Aten and mankind? He's the intermediator, but he's also the, the son of God. Not that this is a new idea. Obviously, the Egyptian king called himself the son of Ra for as early as the fourth dynasty. Akhenaten is taking it a step further, arguably, and saying that he is of the god's flesh. You could say that Amenhotep III, or maybe even some Wasser III, had done that before him by saying that the god Amen Re had visited the, their mother and sexually created. The, new, the next king, such that the king is of the divine efflux. So that, that's, that's um, out there. But Akhenaten, the way he depicts himself underneath the, the solar disk or globe, it could even be a globe because it does have a round um, concavity to it. He's the only one that's touched by the rays of the sun with his wife and his children. Everyone around him is in darkness. He's the only one that is of light. And his body depicts himself in a way that makes him a light being. And I talk about this more in my latest book. That's this one, um, The the Good Kings, um, about kingship and power in the in ancient Egypt. And I have a chapter on Akhenaten. And there I, su I suggest that Akhenaten's strange body with his very, very narrow wrists and elongated neck and very pulled face and slit-like eyes like this, um, that it's a, a way of depicting him as otherworldly, beyond human, and as a being of light, as a body that's distorted by suffusing itself with light, by being melded with light. So Akhenaten is telling his followers and his people that he is of the light, like the sun god. So he's the only one that can speak the language of the sun and communicate what the sun is telling him. They need him to be able to communicate that. And so he writes the great hymn to the Aten to tell us what the Aten is there for, why it exists and what the king's place in the world is with regards to that son. Does Akhenaten remind you of Jesus who says that he's the, the Jesus character in the gospel says he is the messenger of God. He's a son of God. So he, only through him can you get to God? Absolutely. It is. But then I would say that Every Egyptian king reminds me of Jesus. And it's no surprise then that Jesus is the king of the Jews. He is the Messiah. He is also called a king very overtly in gospel texts. And that idea of a king being a necessary interlocutor between this world and the next world, that's something that many political religious uh, systems used as well. It's unusual that in the highlands of the Levant, that this cult of Yahweh broke that cycle. And if you look at your second kings and you understand what it was like for um, David and Solomon, you understand that these kings set themselves up as that kind of interlocutor in a way, but then there are all kinds of uh, issues put, put in their way. They are not Moses. They are not a prophet. They're, they're specifically said to not be those things. And the cult of Yahweh and those priests are essential 
in connecting the king to the religion. That's a very unusual way of going about it. Most places on earth are looking at their king as the connection between the heavens and the earth. And the Egyptians did that arguably better than anywhere else in the world, maybe excluding China or someplace like that. Japan, you might, you might put that in there as well. Circling back to Osiris, do you view the conflict between Osiris and Set, and maybe perhaps the conflict between Horus and Set that followed Osiris's death, um, as being somewhat, in some way, paralleled with the fighting between Satan and Jesus and, say, the Book of Revelation, for example? Yeah, yes and no. Um, you know, let me let me take the the devil section and the the fight between Jesus and the devil in the desert. Let me let me take that first. Um, Seth is is force. He is violence. He is the ability. He has the ability to kill and control, and that military force, that violent force is something that is necessary for most states. So it's not something that you want to jettison. It's something you need. And Seth was the god who stood on the prow of the sun god's bark when it was going through the 12 hours of the underworld. And he was the one who speared Apophis when faced with that snake who was willing and able to swallow up the sun and stop existence from reoccurring stop civilization, stop the light-filled world that we live in. It's Seth that spears that animal so that the sun can then meld with his corpse, with an Osirian corpse, and then become reborn again. So that violent aspect is something that you need. And it's something that the Hebrew Bible God has in spades. It's something that the gods Baal and, and other um, Levantine desert gods also have that violent force. Now, when you have Horus and Seth fighting one another, there are many gods who take Seth's side and say they want Seth to rule after. So the discussion between Horus and Seth or the contendings, the fighting between Horus and Seth is as legal and political as it is theological. You have a tribunal of, of gods who know that Osiris has just been murdered. This is a very bad thing. In many ways, Seth has been banished because of this. But in other ways, there's the understanding that if you're able to murder the king, then maybe you should be king next. And there are many gods, the sun god among them, who believe that Seth should be the ruler of the pantheon after the murder of Osiris because he was able to murder his brother and because he's the strong one. He's the one able to rule and wield power right away, not the child who will probably have to listen to his mother for some time. So it's a, it's very much a legal discussion about how power works and whether power should go to the strongest or whether power should go to the one who has the legal hold on, who has legal claim. And the Egyptians decide in the end, though there's much consternation and a whole lot of fighting and a lot of hijinks ensue, it is decided that it should go to Horus, even though he is a child. And that is very unusual. Egypt is very unusual in that they regularly had child rulers, male child rulers, who ascended the throne, who were not assassinated, who were not taken out by warlords, who are allowed to grow up and learn to be king in the palace, and whose mothers and advisors helped them to learn the position as they grew into it. Any other part of the world, Islands of the Levant, Mesopotamia, Greece, Rome. You put a child king on the throne, nine times out of 10, if not more, that kid would be murdered within a couple of months. And the man holding the bloody knife would say, oh, I'm king. It's, it's all about me. Now, the idea that Seth is evil is something that doesn't really show up on the Egyptian landscape until I would say probably the 8th or 7th centuries BCE. So good half millennium before the, the turn of the millennium and before Jesus or any sort of Jesus cult takes the stage, this idea that there can be an evil incarnate in one being does pre-exist Christian theology. And you can see that in the chiseling away of Seth figures and the destruction of Seth statues, that there seems to be this 
change in attitude in Egypt. Whereas before they could understand, okay, this is a God of violence and force, and this is a God of rebirth and, and growth. Okay, there's Osiris and Seth, we understand we can contain both of them and have temples dedicated to both of them. There comes a point in Egypt in which this becomes untenable. This becomes very problematic. And they decide we need to get rid of this God who is all about the violence. And in fact, he is demonized in a sense. So this demonization of Seth happens after the stories are written about their contendings. And it does change how we understand those those stories of how they fought and the stories of legal uh, of legal succession. But it does bring on more of what you're saying, this idea of the ultimate good and the ultimate bad and these fights between the two. And it, it, it does certainly complicate this tremendously. Now, you also brought up the book of Revelations, which is really interesting because the book of Revelations is written in a maelstrom of imperial expansion by Rome. And people are using a coded language to talk about this bulldozer of power that's just eating up the Mediterranean world and is able to expand in places and enslave people and exploit and, and rape the earth and take all of these people. It's just a very destructive force. And the book of Revelations is written in that context to ideologically understand the forces that are coming at people. It, when life becomes so cheap, when life becomes so insecure, so full of anxiety, people start to turn towards ideology as a relief, as a, an escape, if you like, a way of looking for something after this physical life. You could argue that that kind of thinking was, was finding a footing in the seventh and sixth centuries because the, this was the age when the, the Assyrians invaded, the Persians invaded, um, the, then Alexander the Great comes in, and then we have Rome shortly after that. But the time that the Egyptians start to decide that Seth, this violence, this force, is evil incarnate is exactly when Egypt loses the ability to have native rule and instead is passed about from empire to empire and really finds itself provincialized in many ways. It's in that context that, that Seth is turned into a demon god and is removed from many temples and many of his temples are destroyed. So I would say that it's, a, it's an interesting thing that these religions, they don't come out of nowhere. They come out of a real context and, and that's a significant thing. Um, yeah, so it's, it's, um, I, I think that's kind of where I wanted to go. If there's anything for me to wrap it up, um, you know, we're talking about a huge span of time from the creation of the Horus and Seth story, the contendings of Horus and Seth, which probably has a new kingdom, uh, commitment to paper, to papyrus, but pre-existed that, certainly that story is much older. So if we said that that story exists since 3000 BCE, the political conditions change throughout that time. So the idea of what is the legal succession for a king, it, it changes from 3000 BC to 1000 BC, post Bronze Age collapse. And it certainly changes again when we start to see how Egypt is, is being imperialized by all of these different outside players. It, it just changes the very idea of what masculine divine rule is. And it causes people, I think, to turn towards divinities that are all light, all good, all one, all something, rather than perhaps the more confusing nuanced divinities that can blend in and out of each other, that can contain multitudes and all the different emotions that, that a human could contain. So doesn't the 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 set and Horus story go back to a conflict that um uh that existed between Set and Heru or Horus the Elder and they settled it by boat racing is that correct um there are boat races in the story about the succession after Osiris's death the contendings of Horus and Seth and the boats are made of stone and uh or Seth's boat is made of stone and it sinks 
there's all kinds of different uh, contendings. There's um, all kinds of races and fights, and there's even a rape scene. Uh, Seth tries to rape Horace, and Horace is able to trick him into thinking that he's raping him, but he deposits the, se the semen in his hand, and he gives, he shows his mother Isis the hand with semen, and she screams, and she cuts off her son Horace's hand and regrows him another because she's the mistress of magic and she can do those things. And she puts the semen into Seth's favorite food and he eats the lettuce, the favorite food. And then when he goes to the tribunal and says that he just raped Horus, he says he did a man's deed to him. And all of the gods are like, oh no, then he can't be king, right? If he's just been raped and suffered this indignity because we always blame the victim, don't we? Um, in patriarchal cultures, but so they, they, they are aghast and then they say, prove it and prove it, Seth. And they say, let the semen be called forth. And Seth's of course, just eaten his own semen and the semen comes forth from his own head. And then the gods laugh because they think he's committed auto fellatio. So it's a whole, it's, all, it's meant to be as bawdy and funny as it can possibly be. That story wasn't written down until the new kingdom, probably around, um, as early as 1550, but the version that we have it in dates to around 1200 BCE. But these, the kernels of these stories are, they go all the way back to the pyramid texts. The earliest versions date to around um, 2300 BCE. And so these, um, these stories are there, whether they find their origin in reality or not, I think is indisputable. Succession is always a problem. It's, it's always a problem when the king dies, whether the king is murdered or he dies in some other sort of way in battle, it doesn't really matter. If the king's died after only a few years and he has a five-year-old son or a 10-year-old son, then what do you do? Do you give the kingship to the brother of the king who's standing ready and able to rule now? Or do you give it to the king's son and create the linear succession? Which are you meant to do? And this was something that was of a concern to the ancient Egyptians and obviously something that they had had to deal with multiple times in their own actual history. And then it became mythologized and legalized. And not everyone ruled that way. For example, the Kushites down to the south, you see many brother-brother successions. For a military dynasty like the Kushites, the 25th dynasty of Egypt, you need a strong king following a strong king. That's why in Mesopotamia, Italian Peninsula, Greece, Rome, you don't see many child rulers. They're not able to command an army right away. They're not able to do anything right away. And in places that are as competitive as anything outside of Egypt, you need somebody able to rule right away. Egypt had the luxury and the privilege of passing on that succession to the sun because that was where the lineage of divinity went. That's how powerful this, this theocracy actually was. And what do you make of the uh, Madonna child paralleling um, the depictions of Isis cradling her infant son, Horus? I think it's absolutely a connection. There's, there's no way around it. And it's something that I think would be hard for a Christian, Christian apologist to discount just because visually they look exactly the same. You have the mother seated on a throne, on a seat. Mary is the, the mother of God. She's the queen of heaven. She can sit on a throne. Um, she's there holding the child, this divine feminine. And she can be breastfeeding. She can have a breast exposed. Um, this is typical for Egypt or for the, the mother Mary of the Christian Jesus. And sometimes the the son is on her lap, even as a baby, doing things only an adult could do, pointing at things, giving certain symbols, doing things that you don't expect of an infant. So you see, you see a number of things that this is a baby physically who does still need protection and guidance from somebody, and the mother is the best person, but it's a special infant, even though he hasn't grown up to be this yet, in his mind, in his heart, He's already divine. He's already fully developed. The Egyptians would call that he is king from within the egg. He was born wise, we might say. He, he, he was already what he was meant to be within, but his fleshly body needs to develop. And so he needs that mother 
to, to help him become what he needs to be in the world. And the Egyptians have a wonderful set of stories that you don't see until uh, late in Egyptian history after the, the first millennium BCE. And that's the, but there's glimmers of them earlier. And that's the Horus child who is there able to withstand any of the dangers around him. If he's bitten by a scorpion, he will heal or his mother Isis with her magic can heal him. The story that I just told you of the hand getting cut off, Isis can regrow it. So he's kind of like a, a bionic baby in a sense too, in that he can stare down a scorpion and live. He can stand upon the backs of crocodiles and be unperturbed. He is a superhero baby. And in the Gospel of Thomas, I think it is, there's parts, and you can check me on this, but there's parts where he doesn't know how to control his superhero nature yet. And he actually can kill people accidentally with, the, with his magical powers, the force of his mind and soul and spirit. And he has to be taught by his mother, by others, how to control that, that temper, that ability. It's kind of like um, if you ever saw The Omen and the devil doesn't know that he's the devil yet and he can do things that he doesn't, he doesn't understand and that he has to grow into his physical body, even though he has all of these mental and spiritual possibilities within him. Do you think there is something to the idea um, that the the word Amen used in the, uh, both the Old and New Testaments came from the Egyptian Amen, the God? Um, as far as I know, and I've asked Hebrew Bible scholars as well, this is a false cognate because of the way we write the word. The way the Egyptians wrote the word was with the reed leaf, what we call the yod, which is a vocalized semi-vowel. And it has a, a kind of ah uh, sort of, it's not an ayin, but it, it's a vocalized sound. So it would be like yamin or, or something, something else that's not exactly like the amen that you have in the Hebrew Bible. And so the, the consonants don't line up. And since the Egyptian language is, is um, Hamitic, it's um, African Asiatic, that's the, the way we should call it. And, um, and Hebrew is pure Asiatic, West Asian. You do have similar letters and, and similar things going on in both of these languages and the cognates do not connect. So those two things are different. The, the god Amun's name means the one who is hidden, the one who permeates everything, the one who is omnipresent, if you like. So it's the, it's the divinity that is within everything, that is within all of us, within every plant, within every animal, within the river, within all of the things. And that hiddenness is a very powerful divine element. And the Egyptians would use that to syncretize it to other elements which is how you get the god Amun Re. He's hidden, and then he syncretizes with Re, and then he's visible. He's visible, hidden, all at the same time. He is everywhere, and he is that sun in the sky. So it's uh, it's a wonderful confluence of of physical reality simultaneously. Does the manner in which Osiris was buried, does that remind you of the way Jesus was buried at all? It does. It does. I mean, there's usually discussions of a tomb with a stone in front of it. And a tomb with a stone in front of it is something you might get in Egypt, a rock cut tomb, a shaft tomb. Uh, shaft tombs are often filled with rubble. They might ca be capped with stone if it was something that you would go in and out of. So this tomb-like space is a, an Egyptian type thing. The other thing that's very Egyptian is the idea of a shroud, the idea of being uh, covered in in some sort of a garment or wrapped up in some side, sort of a garment. Now, of course, Jesus wasn't cut up into dozens of pieces as Osiris was, who had to be put back together and made into Egypt's first mummy by his sister wife, Isis. But he was bound up in this shroud and placed into the tomb. And then the thing that I think makes it the most Egyptian is the way Jesus and Osiris are surrounded by women in the burial, that the women are the caretakers. They're the ones who help him to regenerate. They're the ones that keep watch, that guard, that make sure that no one goes in or out. They're the ones that are there 
making sure that he moves into his death so that he can be regenerated. And from the Egyptian perspective, this makes perfect sense. If you can think of Tutankhamun's golden shrines in your mind, or his canopic shrine is even better. It's surrounded on four sides by goddesses with their arms out to, to protect their, their god king. And they're making sure that he's safe. On every Egyptian coffin, you have Isis depicted on the head, every New Kingdom coffin and, and 21st Dynasty, Isis at the back of the head and Nephthys on the bottom of the feet. And then on the chest, you have the goddess Newt as a winged goddess. The deceased is meant to be encased with that feminine protection because that is the womb that he will be reborn in. So this idea of the, that Jesus is surrounded and protected by these women and that one of these women he may or may not have had a sexual relationship with, but that has been excised in the Bible as all of this discussion. Uh, that makes sense that you would have a, a sexual partner so that you could rebirth yourself. Obviously that doesn't happen in the Hebrew Bible story. He comes back to life without any sort of human body. That's okay. Um, Osiris does the same. Osiris does not enter into a womb-like space. That womb-like space is provided for him by the mummy wrappings that Isis puts him in. So you don't need to be like the sun god where you enter into the mouth of Newt so that she can rebear, re, so that she can bury you again in the eastern horizon. That's the way the solar regeneration works. Osirian regeneration is different. He's given a, a separate encasement a cocoon, if you like, so that he can be reborn from that. That's much more similar to the way that Jesus is reborn, using his own regenerative abilities, his own godlike divinity to recreate himself. He breaks out of that wrapping, that shroud, and then can come forth from the tomb. It's a, a very Osirian way to be reborn. And this idea of coming out of, of coming out into the light, of making an appearance. This is also the, the kind of thing that Osiris is said to do. He's said to sprout up. He is the new sprout of wheat, those seedlings of green. Um, these ideas are, are associated with Osiris as well. So basically, you think it's possible that they adopted the, the ritual, uh, the, the ceremony of burying people with a shroud from the Egyptians. You think the Jews could have done that? But I think that most people surround their dead in something. It's a very unusual thing to bury a naked body, a naked corpse. People want their corpses to be encased in something, dressed with something, cared for, cleaned. They don't just dump them into someplace naked, that this is disturbing to us. So I'm not saying that the ancient Egyptians invented the shrouds, but I'm saying that when you read the text and you read how he's he breaks free of these bindings, then I would say that yes, that has an Egyptian flavor to it, whether it's a one to one connection or just something that's part of the cultural memory of a back and forth um, of thought process between the Levant and Egypt. I, I'm not sure, but uh, th this kind of resurrection has a a very Egyptian tinge to it. Does the way that Osiris rises from the dead, do you think that that parallels the way Jesus rose from the dead specifically, or do you think the way Jesus' resurrection was written a bit differently from the way Osiris rose from the dead? Yeah, it's pretty different, isn't it? Because the way Osiris raises from the dead is a very overtly sexual mechanism. And you can see it if you if you want to Google, um, do a Google image of Dendra Chapel Osiris, and you'll see a kind of cartoon-like sequence of events in which Osiris is laying on the bier. He's been cleaned and mummified and wrapped up, and he is very dead. Kind of like in The Princess Bride, he is mostly dead. <laughs> and, and then in the next scene, you see his hand reach out to his phallus. And then in the scene after that, you see Isis atop the phallus, ready to conceive her son Horus because he is moving his hand. He is able to recreate himself. The phallus is risen. And then in the next scene, he rises like the phallus. So 
where the phallus goes, he goes after that. And there's very little discussion of Jesus's rebirth being sexual. Um, having said that, there are medieval understandings of the wound in his left side made by the Roman spear holder uh, at his crucifixion, that that wound has a vagina-like or cervix-like um, vulvic, that's the word I want, a vulva-like shape. And that is um, like a sign of his rebirth to come there. Medieval Christians had no problem with depicting tiny little um, handheld amulets that were in the, the shape of a vulva that were the wound of Christ that showed the symbolism of his rebirth. So there is indeed a sexual component to people's thoughts when they think of Christ's rebirth. But as for it being sexual in nature, I would have to look at the gospel stories more carefully and see what kind of, uh, and I'd have to do so with a Hebrew Bible expert, I think, or, or sorry, Greek expert, to see if any of those words could be, um, could work from a sexual perspective. Because we use double speak all the time. This is why a Bible in English or a Bible in French, wow, that's wonderful. You get the direct word of God. And yet what you're missing from these translations um, is a lot. And, and there's a lot of double entendres and ways of speaking, um, particularly about sexual Congress, when we like to speak around it, not directly at it. Those kinds of things could be there. I'm sure that there have been papers written about this, but I, I'm not a New Testament scholar, so I'd have to, I'd have to rely on you to look for those things. The way you look at um, Ra, who is a progenitor of the Pantheon, um, being reborn every day by going inside Newt and then coming out of Newt, um, does that in some way remind you of, uh, of what you were saying a moment ago about Jesus being speared and it uh, representing his coming rebirth? Yeah, I I think that it does in, in that it's foretold from the beginning. You, you say that this is going to happen. So the spearing is in a way, and it is like an impregnation of his future self, if you like, so that he can rebirth himself. But it's that final death moment that, that then allows the rebirth arguably, um, that no matter how many times, the, the fact that he's killed is what creates the rebirth is a very interesting thing. From the sun god, Egyptian sun god perspective, you don't have a murder. You have an old god, a, an autumn-like god, a ray autumn-like god uh, who, who needs to set in the west just because he's tired and old and he's expiring, he's reached his last breath. And yet there is this understanding that he will sexually regenerate himself with his own mother. And there is a manifestation of the God Amun, who is called Amun Kamutef, which means Amun bull of his mother. So he is the bull having sex with his mother to create his own future self, which is an Egyptian way of understanding the mysteries. How does rebirth happen? How does resurrection happen when you are just you? Well, you, you recreate yourself with your future mother. And that means that your mother is simultaneously consort, daughter, and mother all at the same time. But whether that is perceived as a piercing or anything like that, there, there's no piercing of the, of the sky necessarily. He goes into her mouth and is swallowed by her. Um, he goes underneath the horizon where her mouth is un and then goes inside of her body so that the underworld space is everything that is not sky and not earth it is inside of the sky and then goes through the 12 hours of night within that body. And she is the encasing, she is the casing, the, the, the protective womb for that experience to happen. But I'm not sure if I would make it like a as direct a parallel, but certainly in the broader strokes, it does work. Well, thank you for joining me today, Professor Karakuni. My pleasure. I'm, I'm very happy to, to be able to answer all of these questions.
Hello viewers, thanks for watching this video from the History Valley YouTube channel. Please don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell. And if any of you wish to further support this channel, please consider checking out this channel's Patreon page and becoming a patron. And or donate through PayPal or through Super Chat during your live stream. Thank you.